Let's pray real quick. Jesus, I thank you that as we hear your word, it's going to enter our hearts. That our hearts, Lord, that they're, they're prime ground right now for your word. That it will not just fall on our ears, but Lord, it will explode in our hearts and in our lives. And I thank you, Jesus, that as it does so, we will be forever impacted, forever changed, and propelled forward for your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, from the back to the front, can I hear the loudest amen you've ever given a preacher? A couple people followed it. I don't know about everybody. I'm watching you. This morning, I want to talk to you about something that's really been on my heart lately. I've seen it a lot with teenagers, but then I've seen it even a lot more with some adults. It's pretty crazy when you see it. It's actually a mindset that I want to talk to you about. And that's either having a victor mindset or a victim mindset. Because it alters and it changes how you affect and and how you attack life. See, we can, we can live either of these lifestyles. We can live as a victim, or we can live as a victor. It's a decision that we make. But either one is available to us. We've all seen both sides of the story. We've all seen people in both situations. But this morning, I want to encourage you in it that you, you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. That there is nothing that can stop you when God is behind you. That if God is for you, who can be against you? That there is nothing that will defeat you if God has promised it to you. This morning, I want to come to you out of November, or November, no, Numbers chapter 13, starting in verse 27. I'm going to give you a quick rundown. It's uh, four verses. The one is really long, though. They, then they told them and said, This is 12 spies. We went into the land. It was good. There was milk and honey, just like everybody said. But there were really big walls there. The cities were fortified. There were some scary people there. It just, it was pretty terrifying, to be honest. That's my report. It was pretty terrifying. And then Caleb said, shut your mouth. Let us go up and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men speaking doubt said, we're not able to go against these people. They're stronger than we are. We can't do it. We don't have the ability. We lose. See, that's a victim mentality that I want to talk to you about this morning. And I call that being an Eeyore Christian. I like being able to talk about Eeyore because... Your generation actually knows who I'm talking about. I say it in youth group, and they all look at me like, I literally don't know what that is. What is an Eeyore? It's just, it's beyond me. Eeyore is just the saddest donkey in the world. Actually, when I want extra motivation, I'll go to Google Images and type in Eeyore and just look through it and see how pitiful Eeyore is. It just makes me angry. So it, that's just a little tip. When you want some extra motivation, Google Images Eeyore. It's absolutely sad, but I feel like that's how some Christians operate in life. As an Eeyore Christian, walking around with this cloud above your head raining on you. Oh, bother. Oh, bother. When is God going to show up? Hashtag, it's too hard. Hashtag, I'm over it. Hashtag, depressed. Hashtag, the struggle. We've seen it on Facebook, haven't we? The complaints and the the, the issues. Not everyone has Facebook, I'm sorry, but you might have seen somebody live it. We see these things all the time. And then they'll run to to God's house on Sunday and I'm free, I'm free, and then walk right back out with the cloud over their head. Because we live a, a, a victim mentality at times. It's crazy. Because they started off wrong. They emphatically, their first words out of their mouth, that's where they failed. They said, yeah, it was good. Nevertheless, it was great. But, you know, let's really, let's be real about it. The first problem is they immediately spoke doubt. I don't personally read in the word where it says, now speak to that mountain in doubt and it will be cast into the sea. It's not the word of God says. It says, speak to that mountain in faith. It will be cast into the sea. Immediately, it was nevertheless. We can't do it. I can't see how we can get there. 
And that's, that's how we do things all the time. We can't even look past our nose sometimes. Well, I don't know how we could ever do it. It's really, really strong, and it's really fortified, and I don't know how I could fix my marriage. It's a dump now, and man, my kids, they're just, they're hellions. There's no way I'm getting them back now, and I don't know how I could do this, and it just, it makes no sense to me. That's the funny thing, because naturally, they were never supposed to be able to take the land without God either. See, we can't look past our nose because we're looking at it in a natural sense so many times. Well, naturally, I couldn't do it. Or naturally, I couldn't take this land. Naturally, I couldn't get this job. There's, there's one guy on the youth team. He is the nicest guy in the entire world. Like, when, when you walk him, you're like, man, I love you. He, like, literally, like, jumps, and his heart smiles and says, well, I love you, too. Like, the most genuine person in the world. I love him to death. But he moved here to New York to grow in his walk with him. He moved his family here. And it's so powerful because he actually applied for a job that he had no, he had no right really getting this job. The resume wasn't there. It wasn't stacked up right. None of this was right. Naturally, he had no chance at this. But he put it before God. And, and, and he actually, he, he, he has this job now. His wife, wife was able to quit work. She's able to do what, what her heart wants. He's able to support his family. And I'm telling you, naturally, he should have never done it, but supernaturally, because God called him to it, supernaturally, because the sacrifices he made, he didn't walk around like, oh, bother, I'm never going to get this. It was in faith. By God, I have this. My goodness, I feel it. I feel the favor of God in this move. So you can be an Eeyore all the time and walk around. Oh, I'm depressed. Well, nevertheless, no bother, my life. You can give a million natural excuses as to why it will never happen. But reasoning against the supernatural will disqualify you. You want to know why you haven't moved forward is because you'll, you'll reason against the supernatural power, power of God. See, we could sit back and, well, naturally I could never do it. I don't see how God could. And he won't because you just reasoned against him. Plant seeds of doubt. I'm pretty sure the book of James says a man that's double-minded will get nothing. How can you plant seeds of doubt and expect to get a supernatural harvest? You can't, obviously. But they, these first ten spies, man, they seceded to a people before they even ever tried. How often do we do that? We'll get this, this mentality of, well, it's not even worth trying. Like, I don't know how to do it. Never been there. No one's here to help me. I just, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm not even going to try it. Forget it. I don't want to look stupid. I don't want to fail. How many times have we said that about things that God has promised us? Well, this is your job. Well, this is your marriage, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to go right. It might not look like it right now, but I tell you, and when you stop the mentality, it's going to go in the right position. How many times? Well, I'm not even going to try it. See, you need to be more scared of a false start than you are of failing. You need to be more scared of a false start than you're ever afraid of failing at something. I'm going to say that again because that gets me excited. You need to be more scared of a false start than ever failing. You're going to fail in life. You will make mistakes. Things might not work out perfectly. But if you're too scared to start, you'll never go anywhere. If you're too scared to move forward, you will never accomplish the things that God has called you to. There's one woman in this church, powerful, powerful woman. I love using in-house examples. Man, she launched her own business, and I was talking to her one day. I was like, you should go after some bigger contracts. You never know. Go after this. You're great at what you do. Maybe charge a little more. You're phenomenal. You have a great product. She told me the other week that she ended up getting a $20,000 contract for her business. Like, that's astronomical. That's phenomenal. That's just the beginning. See, if you're too scared to start, if you're too scared to try, it doesn't matter. You'll have nothing to fail at, and you'll have nothing to succeed at. See, these people put forth, these 10 said, well, nevertheless, we're never going to do it. It's not going to work. See, that's an Eeyore Christian, walking around with their head down, walking around with that cloud hanging over their head. Well, the things that have happened to me, I've been through a pain of lifetime. My goodness, what I've experienced. I'm not discounting what you've experienced. 
But I'm telling you, there's a different way to look at it. There's a different way to attack it. See, you can look at it like those 10 spies who said, my goodness, uh, God called us out here, but it's not going to work. He called us out of Egypt, but he's not strong enough to get us into the promised land. He beat an entire nation, and now there's just some giants. My goodness, we're not going to make it. We should just go back to Egypt. Like, they'll accept you any better than you left. That's pretty dumb. But then there's, there's two spies that came back, and they had a different mentality. I don't want to talk about the negative all morning. I want to talk about this mentality, the victor mentality. You can be a victim all your life, and that's fine. And you can expect that kind of attention, and if that's what fuels you, go, go ahead. Or you can be a victor, and you can step forward in what God has called you to do. You can use those things that were meant for bad to fuel you to accomplish great things in Jesus Christ. You can press forward towards the upward call of Jesus Christ. Or you can sit back with a cloud over your head, hashtag depressed the rest of your life because of what has already occurred. It says, and then Caleb quieted the people before Moses. This is the congregation, the nation standing there. It's like, you guys shut up with your whiny attitude. Eeyore, I'll kick you. Stop it. Shut it. It says, surely, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are able to overcome it. Let us go up at once. It wasn't, well, let's wait till the morning and think about how we should do it. He said, let's go. Let's go now. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what it feels like to them. I don't care about the fears. I don't care about the, the, the arguments about it. I know what God has spoken. Let's go at once. Let's get up at once. Let's start moving ahead. Let's press forward now. See, you can miss your window of opportunity. Pastor talked about times and seasons the other day in leadership. There's a time to attack, and it's now. It's not to sit back and let the cards play out. It's time to start moving ahead in what God has spoken and start to shift and see things change because you're pressing forward in the call of God. Let us go up and take it at once. See, victors, you ready? They take the promises of God. I saw a post the other, the other day. It made me mad, and it was like, Seven verses that people take out, or seven quotes that aren't really biblical. And one was, you can take things from God. Man, you got to be kidding me. Did you ever read about the woman with the issue of blood? God didn't walk up to her and be like, be blessed, you're good. She took that. She knew the promise of God. And that was, if I can get close, if I can just touch a little bit of them, if I can just snag a little bit of them, I can take what I need for my own body. See, we can sit back as victims the rest of our lives, or you can get a victor mentality and say, if I can get around God, if I can experience God just once, if I can touch him just once, I can get what he's promised me. See, you can take what you've been promised. Caleb said, let's walk into the land. Let's take what he promised us let's go up into the promised land but victors victors man, they get things accomplished and it's funny because the victims complain about them well i don't know why they're so successful well prosperity is not really the gospel okay have fun with that you and your rain cloud go over there victors they use situations as fuel man you know how excited it gets me when I hear people say, well, there's a lot of giants over there. Be careful. <laughs> Thank you for the extra motivation. Well, you don't know what happened in my life. Thank you for the motivation. See, we can sit back and say, well, it's scary and it hurt. Yeah, I'm not going to discount it. I'm sure it is, and I'm sure it did. That's real. But what's also real is how you can look at it. You can look at it and say, while it might have been scary, while it might have been real, I'm not going to let the devil punk me down anymore. I'm not going to start fighting. Does not the Bible say that the devil is under your feet? How can you lose a fight to someone who's punching your ankles? Does not make any sense. We can look at it and say, you know what? Yeah, that might have happened. How dare him try to take my promise? How dare him try to steal that from me? You know what? That's not going to beat me down. That's going to motivate me to push forward. Even in the youth ministry, yeah, man, 
Another one was doing something stupid. Motivation to go after them. Motivation to destroy the kingdom of hell. Motivation to go after it even harder. It can be hashtag depressed. Or it can be, I can't believe that stupid devil tried to steal that from me. I can't believe he tried to destroy my family. Wait till you see what I do. Wait till you see. You've got to have the spirit of God. When he said, he said to Moses, he said, wait till you see what I do to Pharaoh. You can have that spirit. Says, you wait till I see. Wait to see what happens. Wait to see what happens to the kingdom of darkness. You can complain about it, or you can start to press forward. You can look at it as something that's, that can destroy you, or you can use it as fuel for your next fight. You can use it as motivation to kick the teeth in of the devil, to not sit back, to not be, not be complacent, to not be destroyed. You're not called to be destroyed as a Christian. You're called to have nothing missing, nothing broken, and nothing lost. I thought we had a deal. Come on. See, this is where we make our mistake. Well, there's giants in the land, Pastor. Good. Giants possess the land to activate your faith. Their big thing was, well, we can't go in the land because there's giants. Good. Because, see, if you could walk in there with no issues and no fight, you're going to think you did that on your own. You don't need faith to walk into something that's completely empty. You need faith to go destroy a giant. You need faith to decapitate that giant like David did. You need faith to speak like one of the, one of the two that came back. He said, we're going to go in there. We're going to eat them like bread. Weird, but we're going to eat them like bread. They're nothing to us. Numbers 14, 8, and 9, if you think I'm lying. That's really what they said. When God is working through us in faith, that's when he gets the glory. See, there might be giants in the land, but you've already defeated them if you'll walk in there and fight them. You've already won that battle. How could you ever know if your marriage will get right unless you walk into it with your head up ready to, ready to correct it? How will you ever know that that job isn't already yours unless you go for the interview? How will you know how your kids will respond unless you really tell them the truth? How will you know unless you really step out and try it? You won't. You'll be a victim the rest of your life looking back at, well, I wish this would have happened. Well, if only God was faithful in it. He was, you just didn't move. Giants possess the land to activate your faith. <laughs> and faith is active, is it not? Faith isn't just a, a scripture you quote before you go to bed and everything's good. Faith is something that you act upon. Just like I already said, their active faith was David went out and he he launched a rock at a giant and killed him. These spies said, let's go eat them like bread. Their faith was active. See, we need an active faith when we're going to possess a land. We need active faith to be a victor. We need active faith to press forward and, 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 and partake in the promises of God. We need an active faith to not sit back but to press forward and progress the vision of God. Without it, we're not going to be anywhere. We'll be sitting in the same seat with your butt impression on it, second service, every week, with the same empty seats next to you, if we're not moving forward. I'm going to take this from first service because I think it's powerful. Second Timothy 4 and 6 through 8. This is Paul writing to Timothy. He said, as for me... My life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me. See, Paul said I had active faith towards the promises of God. Man, Paul was shipwrecked, beaten, Stoned a few times, bitten by a snake, imprisoned. There's a couple things that happened in Paul's life where he could have sat back and been a victim. Well, God, I don't know why I'm shipwrecked. God, I don't know why. Hashtag imprisoned. God, hashtag. God, I don't know why all these things have happened to me. He could have had that mindset. Instead, he said, I fought that fight. 
I had, I had active faith. I ran the race, active faith. I remained faithful, active faith. And now the prize awaits me. I said, I poured my life out. I poured it out. I didn't sit back as a victim. I pushed forward in the victory of Jesus Christ. And because I fought, because I ran, because I remained faithful, this is where I'm at. See, I see, I read that, and I don't see it amongst most Christians. I see, and I got offended at church and left. And I wasn't used how I thought my gift should be, so I went to another building. And I slept in because it was cold. And the football game was on at 9.30, live streaming on Yahoo. So I stayed home and live streamed both. Okay. Doesn't look like pouring anything out. It's cool. I'm going to incorporate this a little bit. It's cool that that drink offering that Paul talked about in 2 Timothy and Philippians 2 is the same drink offering that was poured out in Numbers when they were, Leviticus, when they were about to, about to, didn't make it, go to the promised land. It was one of the sacrifices that were made. We see drink offerings, they give the ability to go to a new level and access to new places. But we don't want to pour it out because it's uncomfortable. But when you pour your life out is when you can progress the kingdom. When you don't hold anything back is when you can progress the kingdom. Galatians 2.20 shows us that there's been an exchange in ownership. It's no longer I who lives but Christ who lives in me. And if it's you living, you'll stay home. And, and, and because it's cold. When it's you living, you'll get offended. When it's you living, you won't feel like going that week. When it's you living, you won't feel like reading your Bible. But when it's Christ living in you, those things are fulfilled and propelled forward. See, there's an exchange of ownership that we need to recognize. And then when the exchange of ownership is recognized, it's not hard to pour anything out. It's not hard to give everything to Jesus. It's not hard to unlock all those secret doors and unlock those pains and unlock the, the, the nasty parts of our heart. It's not hard when we recognize an exchange of ownership at all. I want to show an example real quick. And uh, someone got picked out by one of our uh, head pastors. He said it would be perfect. Dan, can you, can, can you come up real quick? Yeah, you. I'm looking right at you. Blue shirt. Really big guy. Dan. Thank you, Dan. While he comes up here, see Philippians 2 says, I am pouring my life out like a drink offering. In 2 Timothy, you can say right down there, we don't, you're too tall. And in 2 Timothy 4, he said, I have poured my life out. And see, while Paul went through all those horrible situations, he still continued to pour his life out for other people. See, when we pour our life out, it's like, well, I want a million dollars. That's not pouring out for Jesus. But when we pour our life out for the church, when we give all that we have for the church, that's when we start to see a difference and a shift and a change. See, it looks something like this. And I love Dan because he just started coming not too long ago, but he's been pouring his life out for this building. And what happens is he starts to pour his life out, and then there's access to new places and new levels and the supernatural and the blessing of God and the favor of God but too often we don't want to pour it out because it's uncomfortable because it's still us living but what happens and what we fail to see is that while I pour that out on Dan then Dan has the ability to pour it out on somebody else and that somebody else has the ability to pour out and it progresses the kingdom forward when you progress the kingdom is when you start to live as a victor. Thank you, Dan. You're one. He looked at me like he's gonna kill me later. Make sure the security in the hall, please. He's rather large. <laughs> Be mad at your boss. <laughs> See, it's all about our mindset and the situation. And in fact, it's about what we know. Because if you don't know that you're a victor, how could you ever operate as one? And if you don't know that you have power, how could you ever operate with it? And if you don't know that you're free, how could you ever operate like it? And if you don't know that a cloud shouldn't be following you, how will you ever live like it? See, you can be a victim or you can be a victor. And that's where, that's where daily Bible reading comes in so important. Man, I, we hit this hard with teenagers. That's where daily Bible reading is important. You need knowledge so you can be equipped. And if you're not equipped, how could you ever live differently?
can't be mad at you. Well, you can be disappointed. Read your Bible, please. It's very important. But does not the word of God say that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus? How could you be a victim if you're more than a conqueror? How could you get beat down if you're more than a conqueror? How could you be destroyed if you're more than a conqueror? How could you ever lose if you're more than a conqueror? How could you look at that promise of God and not go take it even though there might be a giant if you're more than a conqueror? What's crazy to me is uh, there's a man, a, a mighty evangelist, his name is Dr. Rodney Howard Brown. And his daughter passed away. I think she was about 16. I don't remember her exact age, but she was about 16. And you look at it and be like, man, I would be so mad at God if my kid died. That's the mindset most of us look at those things with. But he did something completely different. He said, I'm not a victim to the situation. The devil just made me mad. The devil just took something that, that mattered to me. How dare him? How dare him? So what he did instead is he started something called the Great Awakening, where he's pushing to have 10 million souls saved, to win 10 million souls, because the devil made him angry. How many situations can we look at in our life where we say, how dare you try to steal this from me? How dare you try to destroy my family? How dare you try to take my happiness? How dare you try to take my peace? How dare you try to take this? How dare you? How dare you? Who do you think you are? I'm coming after your neck. But so often, we'll look at it as just like the world. Will. Well, she's gone, and how dare God? mm, -mm. How dare you, devil, ever try to think you can take this from me? I'm going to come and I'm going to personally destroy everything you set in place. And if we can have some victors rise up, it's not a victim mentality any longer. It's not woe is me. It's not a cloud floating over your head. Because why would anybody want to follow you with a cloud over your head? You can have a one-man pity party and that's not fun. But instead, when you start walking in victory, say, how dare you, devil? I'm more than a conqueror. You're under my, I thought we had a deal. You're under my feet. You have no right. You have no peace. You have no place in my things. You have no voice. You have no ability. Shut up. Go sit in your corner. There's a shift. There's an absolute shift that needs to occur. You're not a victim. You are a victor through Christ Jesus. And when depression, hashtag depression, gets destroyed, when laziness gets destroyed, when fear gets destroyed, when anger gets destroyed, you can be free. That's one of the promises of God. I mean, the atonement was for salvation. But it was also for healing, and also for that depression, and also for that cancer, and also for that family issue. It, it, it was for the completeness of you, the wholeness of you. It wasn't for a bit of you, it was for all of you. You're not a victim. This morning, what is it that the devil's tried to steal from you? I'm telling you, when you see a giant, you should get a big smile on your face. Not just because they're ugly. When I say giant, I think of uh, Sloth from, uh, what's that movie? The Goonies. Sloth from The Goonies. Just big and ugly. You big, ugly thing. That's what I think of when I say giants. So it's not really scary. It's just annoying. You're in the way. Move your big, dumb body. Get out. You should be excited when you see a giant, because it means there's a time of promotion in your life. He was about to move them into the promised land, but there was a giant. David was anointed king, and he was about to make some moves when he killed his giant. You should be excited when you see a giant. There should be a big old grin on your face, because it's time for promotion. It's time to go to a new level. It's time to go to a new place. It means the devil's got something in your way trying to scare you. It means the devil's trying to steal what, what, what's been promised to you. It's time to get a smile on your face and say, 
You're stupid. You, get, you showed your hand. That's where I should be. You're, you're, you're absolutely foolish. Thank you for showing me what I should have conquered next. Thank you that these things are fuel, and now I have another place to conquer. It's all about how you look at it, family. You can be a victim to situations, or you can use them to fuel your next victory. And when you see those giants in the land, it's time to get excited and say, I'm going to eat you like bread, or I'm going to cut your head off and hold it up in front of your army so you start running too. You know that's what happened, right? <laughs> he, he didn't just hit him with a rock. He then cut his head off and then held it up in front of the army that was running away. It's pretty intimidating. I like it. Those giants will flee when you, start to, when you activate your faith. Those giants will bow when you start to live as a victor. Those giants will be destroyed when you start to walk into the promised land. Not that it will be empty, but that it's time to walk into your victory. See, if you always cower, you'll always be plundered. If you cower, you'll be plundered. If you cower, you'll have everything taken from you. Everything. Say, so, well, I'm just a passive person. I don't like confrontation. Man, you got the spirit of a living God inside of you. The one who's going to come back on a horse and not even have to pull his sword out and kill anybody. It's going to be through his tongue. You got a victor living on the inside of you. Proverbs 30, 30. You're not going to, you're going to operate as a lion. You're not going to turn aside for no giant. You're not going to be turned aside by anything. See, this morning, I want to let you know that you can continue, wow, continue to be a victim with a cloud over your head, raining down hashtag depression, raining down hashtag fear, raining down hashtag I got beat up, raining down hashtag my life sucks, raining down the struggle. You can have that over your head the rest of your life, or you can operate in the promise of Jesus Christ, and that's that you are more than a conqueror through him. The devil is under your feet. And I'm not going to lose by getting punched in my ankle. I'll lift it up and just, just stupid. It's crazy to me. I believe that we have a body of Christ that's going to raise up and start to shift this. this we're going to shift this region. Because you know what the issue is? It's going to be contagious. The Spirit of God, Christianity, should be like an infection that spreads. I, you want to know why? Because so many people in our area play the victim. Well, you don't know what happened in my life. Well, you don't know about Elmira. Well, you don't know about this. And you, Man, stop playing the victim. When as the body of Christ, we can stand up and say, I'm a victor through Christ Jesus. And I don't care what what my, my area looks like. I know the giants I'm facing. I know what I'm going to slay. I know what's trying to stop me, and I'm smiling at its ugly face. That's not just for me. That's for you. And when you bring that out, it's contagious. Nobody wants to be an Eeyore. Eeyore doesn't even want to be Eeyore. Think about Eeyore. He's a donkey. I almost used the biblical word, didn't. He's a donkey. Donkeys are supposed to be stubborn. They're supposed to be workhorses. They're supposed to be immovable, but he's broken. You should be absolutely stubborn for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You should be a workhorse for the vision and for freedom. You should be immovable by what the devil is trying to throw at you. Don't be an Eeyore. It's time to step up and time to defeat what the devil is throwing at you. Whether it be the past, you can use it as your fuel. Whether it be the giants that you're looking at right now, it's time to step into your promised land because it's a time of promotion in this area. It's a time to defeat those things. And it's not just the church. We see other organizations popping up. Let Almire live. Amen. We see other community organizations trying to shift and change. Amen. I agree with it. It's time the church leads it. You can be a victim or you can be a victor the rest of your life. But when you allow that to rise up inside of you, that the promise of God is that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8, 37, if you want a scripture reference. 
you are more than a conqueror. There's not anything that's going to get in my way. I'm going to destroy it. Man, does not the Bible say that the, the devil will never be able to stop the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? Man, you are an unstoppable force serving an unstoppable God. You're an immovable people serving an immovable God. You are a victorious people serving the victorious God. And it's through Christ Jesus. That's it. If you guys can stand up all over this place. I don't like preaching a long time. I like to get my point across real quick. I don't want you to leave. Too many people leave during altar call. Just stay right here. God might speak something specifically to your heart. Altar calls, man, now's the time you should be praying. God, what do you need me to do? What do you want? What do you need? What do you want? What should I shift? What should I change? Amen. Today you're saying, you know what? I've never given my life to Jesus, but I want the victory that he's had. I'm telling you, it's more than just a victory he offers. It's a wholeness, nothing missing, nothing broken, and nothing lost that he has to offer you. And it's through his son, Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven, lived a perfect life, sinless life, made no mistakes, who raised up people to bring the message past him, who sacrificed his life, was beaten, whipped, ridiculed, crucified on a cross, To raise three days later with the keys of sin and death in his hand. Revelation 118. To then be sitting at the right hand of Jesus of God praying for you right now. That's you you're saying, I want to accept the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I want you to raise your hand, saying, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus for the first time, or I'm ready to return because I've walked away. Can I see your hand? Be honest with yourself. This is eternity. Amen. I see those hands. And with those hands still raised, can I see you walk right up out of your seat with boldness and meet me at the front right here? With boldness. Don't, you got a room full of people that are cheering for you. This is the best decision you could ever make. You didn't have to raise your hand to do it. It can be. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. 